Okay, so uh, I'm Dean Wampler. I, I joined AnyScale last fall uh, before all of the stuff blew up. Uh, AnyScale is the company that uh, was spun out of Berkeley basically to develop Ray. Um, I believe uh, the, one of the co-founders, uh, Robert, uh, spoke to you guys uh, last fall as well. Um, these links I'll have on the last slide too. One thing I might want to call out is we're going to have some online uh, events, sort of mini conferences and uh, training that we're going to be rolling out over the summer. And you can find out about that at anyscale.com slash events. All right, so, so why Ray? Um, there's really a couple of big things going on in our industry uh, that were are pretty obvious to all of us in this group. The first one is that um, machine learning models are growing at you know, 35 times in size uh, every 18 months compared to Moore's Law, which is like you know 2x every 18 months. So it's just outstripping hardware uh, in an amazing way. And the other thing too is that the uh, Python community is just growing like mad because of uh, you know all the interest in machine learning and so forth in particular. And that's really driving the need for uh, solutions for distributed Python, not just across you know uh, leveraging every core in your uh, uh, single machine, but across a cluster to do some uh, really heavy lifting. And that's really kind of the, the theme of Ray is to make it as easy as possible to, with relatively few code changes to write applications in Python and maybe eventually other languages that can scale across a cluster pretty easily, pretty transparently, uh, so that you can address a lot of the uh, kind of stages or areas of focus in, in modern machine learning like you know, featureization and uh, processing streams, hyperparameter tuning, training, simulation, and model serving. Um, a lot of these, especially training and hyperparameter tuning, are just require extraordinary compute these days. And so how can we make that better? So a core framework called Ray and then libraries for these um, you know, high-level functionalities that's, that are built on top of Ray. We wanted Ray to be as uh, intuitive and concise as possible, and that means trying to make things as familiar as possible. So if you take these two functions that are you know, standard Python, something that we're you know, used to writing all the time, and you annotate them with this uh, Ray.remote annotation, then that turns them into what we call tasks. And these will be things that are distributed around your cluster or around the course on your laptop, as the case may be, so that you can get maximal compute leverage. And just for completeness, there's a couple of imports on the right that are required. And, and you'd also have to put in something for the definition of A in the first function. But anyway, just wanted to illustrate the, you know, the transformation that's required. And basically what happens is this, you also uh, call these functions in a different way. It's now make array.remote to actually invoke it. There was a decision made to keep the remote key, uh, function here in place rather than completely engineer the function so that you just call make array. And the reason they uh, decided to leave remote in is so that it's obvious when you read the code what's remote and what isn't. So uh, you know, it saves you the trouble of having to figure out things that maybe you don't understand. What's actually returned when you call this thing and it comes back immediately even though you're now running an asynchronous process is it returns an ID that corresponds to a future and that future will be used to retrieve the value later. You know, if I call this again, I'll uh, basically uh, get another future back. And then if I call this add raise method, then I'll get you know, the final result back that'll be in this uh, future ID, ID3. A couple of interesting things are going on here. Um, add arrays uh, is supposed to be taking uh, NumPy arrays, but I'm actually passing um, you know, IDs in, in this example. But because they're remote uh, tasks, Ray will figure out that it has to extract the objects and pass them to add array. So I don't have to do that myself. The other thing Ray is gonna do is I basically set up a graph of computation and Ray will sequence the graph by you know, calling things in the right order. Uh, the first two make array calls can be done in parallel because they don't depend on each other, but they'll have to finish before the uh, add arrays can be called. And Ray just handles that for you. You don't have to do anything like waiting and, uh, and you know, any sort of manual distributed computing to make this work. And then finally, to get the value from this future, you call this blocking call ray.get, and that's when you actually get the value when you need it. Now, one of the big problems in distributed computing is actually managing distributed state across the system. This is maybe the biggest weakness uh, in like uh, serverless computing, at least the way it was originally conceived by people like Amazon. They really gave you no mechanism for managing distributed state. Once again, we try to make it as intuitive as possible by using the, the class model in uh, 
uh, Python. So we're all used to writing classes where we have some embedded state inside the class that's uh, encapsulated it within it. There's functions with it that you know we use to manipulate and retrieve it and so forth. And all we have to do is annotate it again with the same annotation and now it becomes an actor. The word actor comes from the actor model of distributed computing. It's actually like a 40, 50 year old uh, approach to uh, distributed computing. It's actually a personal favorite of mine because I used to work uh, in the Scala world where the ACA system was a really popular system for actors. Basically, the way to think of it is these are like autonomous agents. I'm going to send it messages to do things, and it will do them in a thread safe way without me having to write thread safe code at all. So I get the the same sort of behavior of tasks distributed around the cluster, but now I get uh, state management with it as well in a reasonably intuitive way. And I basically invoke it the same way with these remote calls. Notice how things are constructed and how method calls are made in this case. But it's using the same task model under the hood. Speaking of under the hood, let's, let's actually have a little look at how things work schematically inside Ray. Again, using this uh, task graph that we set up before. So here, imagine I have a three node cluster and on each of these nodes is a scheduler process that uh, Ray uses to figure out where to run things. There's an object store and we'll see what that's for in a second. And then there are these worker processes to which I'm gonna assign work to do. And then there's this global control store that's gonna keep track of where everything is for me. So let's suppose that my driver program is running on node one. And when I actually invoke these uh, uh, tasks, they'll all get sent to the local scheduler and it will decide what to do with them. And it might decide, well, I should say, it's gonna immediately return the IDs. Even though these are asynchronous computations, it immediately returns the futures so I can go on and do other things. Uh, and then the global control store is keeping track of where all this stuff is. So the, the scheduler might decide it's got space on the first worker on its node, so it'll schedule uh, one array task to run there but maybe it decides that it needs to send uh, a different one to another task, another node. And once they're finished, they're actually gonna write the object that they return, in this case, a NumPy array to the object store. And we use the ID1 and ID2 to get object one and object two respectively, if we actually wanted to get them explicitly. But now that these are done computing, we can now schedule add arrays to run. So we do that, you know, maybe put it on the second worker on node one, um, it doesn't have to copy the object one out of the object store. It actually uses shared memory. And if object one were enormous, this can be a huge uh, compute saver, but I just have it in one place. I can just read it directly without having to copy it to the, uh, the worker processor space. However, object two is on the other node. So I do have to copy this over to object, uh, to the node one, to its object store. Now it can be read and I can add the arrays and then write the result back to the local object store. And then when we call that ray.get that we saw earlier, it will reference ID three and that will return object three. So that's sort of what's going on under the hood. Obviously there's a lot of sophistication involved, but we try to make this as transparent to you as possible so that you just think about sequencing uh, asynchronous and synchronous tasks and then we handle kind of the heavy lifting for you. So what if you want to actually try Ray? Well, one of the things we realize is that, you know, people are used to using a lot of libraries like async.io, joblib, multiprocessing.pool. So we've actually implemented versions of these. And the reason you might use our versions is because they actually break the node boundary. Instead of being limited to one node, you can actually run these things over a cluster. And usually the only thing you have to change is the import statement, as in this example for multiprocessing.pool. So uh, that's one way that uh, people have actually uh, used this to accelerate um, uh, multiprocessing on, for example, uh, scikit-learn. We actually, there's a link here to our blog about a, uh, a description about how all of this is operating under the hood, but uh, there's also a newer blog post that talks about using this with scikit-learn on our website. So, you know, it turns out though that a lot of people will never actually use that Ray API. It's obviously very low level. It's not something you'd necessarily want to use if, if you could avoid it. And you can avoid it in a lot of cases if there's a higher level library. So there's, there's been a lot of work to build machine learning based libraries on top of Ray, most of which were sponsored or, or um, uh, motivated by the, the challenges of large scale machine learning like we mentioned at the beginning. And that's really why Ray was created in the first place. Um, 
so for example, going back to that uh, chart I had uh, earlier, we've got several of these libraries in, that have just come out recently. Tune and RLlib, I'll talk about briefly. They've been out a little while. Our, uh, Ray SGD was actually just announced this week with another blog post. And then Sur for model serving, which doesn't even have an icon yet. Uh, that's it's also relatively new. But the, uh, the RLlib uh, for reinforcement learning is one of our most popular and it's basically the, uh, addressing this uh, hugely to hot topic now in re uh, machine learning where we, we train an agent in an environment to maximize some reward, like you know, win AlphaGo or, or rather go against the world's best player or beat uh, uh, an Atari game or to teach some uh, simulator how to walk and so forth. And it usually involves some big neural network under the hood that's, that's uh, basically figuring out the policy you should follow uh, you observe what's going on, like the state of the board. You decide what action to take next, when, you know, where to place your next stone. And in this case, the re reward is pretty simple. Either you win or you don't. And there's a huge number of, of algorithms that have been written for this. A lot of different ways you can approach problems like reinforcement learning in, in a lot of industry ways, as well as these sort of uh, research projects. One of the most interesting one, actually, for me is this one on the left industrial process uh, automation is, is turning out to be a hot topic for reinforcement learning now. But anyway, you, you, you'd like to be able to think about the domain and then figure out sort of the general uh, approach you wanna take, whether it's you know using a single agent or hierarchical or offline batches like using logs to try to train something when you can't like rerun a chemical factory or something just to try training your model system. And then on top of that is hopefully a uniform API that's uh, implementing under the hood a vast array of different algorithms that have been published. Switching to hyperparameter tuning, why is this important? Why did we write this library called Tune? Well, it turns out what hyperparameters are basically are things like this. What is the structure of this neural network that I think is going to be best for natural language processing or whatever? You know, how many layers, what kind of layers, what are the like size of pools and you know, which ones are pools or strides and so forth. These are sort of the metadata about the model or the hyperparameters. And often the first step is figuring out what's the best choices before I even get to actually training the model for production. And as you can imagine, the way to do this is basically keep trying different versions of your model training it, seeing how it does, trying a different version, seeing how that does, it becomes extremely compute expensive. But it really matters. Oftentimes the performance of your model depends a lot on these choices. So you really do want to get kind of the best result. And this graph, you know, the higher you are on this graph, the better the, the, the score on the simulator. And uh, th these three different versions basically represent different models. So you want the best model but resources are really expensive. And even if you, you know, maybe you're willing, uh, maybe you don't have a lot of resources, but then you're gonna waste a lot of time waiting for things to finish. So there's a whole body of research going into optimizing this process. And that's what Tune is trying to encapsulate for you. And the last thing I just wanna talk about briefly is how, you know, getting a completely away from like machine learning and all that, is Ray relevant for microservices? Or, well, we now know microservices are suddenly no longer hip, so maybe they're macro services or we're going back to monoliths. It all kind of uh, is the same thing, really. But let's talk about how this, this is applicable here. Um, and just very briefly, you know, microservices uh, originate for a lot of reasons, but one of the key things that I want to talk about in this case is this challenge that you may conceptually, logically have your well-partitioned microservices in your environment, but the management process can be a real pain because now you need to scale all of these instances independently. Uh, maybe some of them may need to be deployed a lot more uh, regularly. It's one of the big challenges actually that is kind of driving this reaction against microservices is the difficulty of managing them when you're not experienced at it. And on the right, you know, I just sort of schematically show that some of these microservices need a lot more instances than others. Well, why do we actually have all of these instances? Well, one reason might be for resilience in case, you know, one instance goes down then we have others for backup. That's entirely reasonable. But the other reason is because all of these things often represent, you know, hitting the, the boundary of available resources on a particular node. So we need lots of nodes to, to meet all of the uh, resource requirements for our deployment. 
Well, if we've turned everything into one giant node effectively by abstracting over the, the resources in the cluster, then we can go back to this model of basically having sort of one pseudo instance or logical instance, if you will, and then magically sort of behind the scenes, Ray handles uh, scaling uh, the, the actual deployments of these tasks over the cluster as needed where resources happen to be. You know, I don't want to oversimplify what's involved here. There's obviously differences whether you're going over a process or rather a machine boundary to another machine or not. But we think in general, this will actually help make it a lot easier for people to write scalable microservices because they won't have to think as much about explicitly managing instances of these things. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, we are hiring actually. I actually did post a link in the Slack channel about this. Um, if you wanna learn more about Ray, go to ray.io. Check out the events. The events page isn't really uh, full of a lot of details yet. We're still working out some of them, but you can get a sense of what we've got planned. We are hoping to have a, a Ray Summit in San Francisco in November. Who knows if it'll happen? And I'd love to hear from you, dean at anyscale.com.